On Grey's Anatomy season final, Griffith, Alexis Floyd, receives the first hit from Cupid's arrow. One would think Griffith would excuse herself from cramming in a few hours in the emergency room, despite the fact that it's her wedding day and everyone makes the strange decision to go to work in their nice clothing. Adams must be allowed to channel his Aunt Meredith, pleading with her to chose him, choose him, and love him, as Griffith must lock eyes with him. Neither does he. Along with Millen, Helm, and Yasuda, another love couple, assist Griffith in getting ready for the sweet outdoor wedding. Unfortunately, there are a number of indicators that Griffith won't betray. Her dress's zip malfunctions. Her mother's favorite bird, a robin, crashes into a window and perishes. In addition, there won't be any flowers at the wedding. The biggest shocker is that Griffith's grandmother permits her to remain single if she falls in love with Duane rather than Mary and Kenneth. With Alzheimer's, Griffith's grandma believes she is speaking to her daughter. Duane is Griffith's father's name. This implies that Griffith's mother had a previous relationship with another man, which she ended in favor of Duane. Griffith enters Yasuda's van and speeds off to the hospital, where she approaches Adams and informs him that she did not get married. Even though she is wearing her wedding gown, it is not odd at all for him to accompany her to the on-call room so Adams may act as like he is on his own honeymoon. Adams' postcoital high is short-lived when the trauma patient is revealed to be Griffith's fiance tray preventing the couple from canoodling all day. On his way to the hospital to get Griffith back, he was involved in an automobile accident. He knows something is there as soon as he sees her and Adams together and punches Adams in the face. While caring for a little boy who has obviously overdosed on something, Juan loses out on all the excitement. His prompt actions save the boy's life, but according to protocol in cases like this, CPS must be contacted. Quan feels betrayed by the CPS worker's dismissal of his offer to translate for the mother who speaks Spanish. When the guy doesn't ask for a translator, he becomes more irate. Quan notices fentanyl in the boy's bloodstream and learns while checking on Maxine that the mother is being brought to the police station. Maxine exhorts Quan to act on his instincts and defend the family. He quickly discovers that the youngster consumed what he believed to be conventional gummies when he was living at the rental home that belonged to the previous tenants issue is resolved. Maxine is exulting on her contribution to this triumph when she suddenly becomes short of breath and codes. Quan requests a chest tube, but someone soon points her that Maxine has signed a DNR. She is intubated despite his lack of concern. When Millen gets back from the wedding, she is furious and struggles with the conflict between loving Quan for saving Maxine's life and hating him for placing Maxine in a predicament she didn't want to be in. What's the exact opposite of saving lives, do you know? crashing in an aeroplane accident. There was a time when I believed that half of our cast had perished. Fortunately, the writers only need a brief realization of what matters most in life from everyone on this particular journey. Everyone associated with the Catherine Fox Award flies to Boston aboard the company jet. Amelia and Winston lock hands as everyone's lives seem to flash before their eyes due to the intense turbulence. While Catherine cries, Bailey knocks Richard's martini out of his hand, and Nick is only thinking about Meredith. Despite the fact that he actually goes to her Boston home to express his love, Michael answers the door and informs him that Meredith is at work. Meredith texts Nick asking him to meet her in her lab. Richard, Bailey, and Amelia welcome him and discover Meredith muttering to herself on the floor about how everything is terrible. Has Meredith fallen apart? This she herself exhibits symptoms of Alzheimer's. She recently learned that all previous research on Alzheimer's is false, and we need to re-examine everything from the beginning. All of Direct's research and the ideas of everyone else who ever considered healing the sickness are therefore no longer relevant. She is instructed by Richard to remain silent for the next five years until she has reliable proof. She is urged by Nick to blow it up and create some commotion. She didn't travel to Boston to adhere to the laws. What is Meredith's job? She is honest with a group of donors seated at a table. The other experts at the Gray Sloan table wait for the lucky victor to receive the prized award as Catherine watches in dread. Will it be them? Nick or Maggie and Winston, our third couple of sweethearts? Is their union still intact? Yes. Do they intend a divorce? No. Will they manage to live in two different places while producing groundbreaking work in their respective fields? Exactly why not? When Catherine eventually steps up to the podium, Meredith is given the honor of announcing the nominees rather than Bailey. Bailey is momentarily perplexed but quickly understands that she will be honored with the Catherine Fox Award for her contributions to reproductive health care, not the excellent medical professionals there. 
surprise. Amelia finds it all to be too much. Richard is invited to attend an AA meeting with her. When Amelia departs, a waiter brings him the gin and tonic he ordered. He insists on waiting for Catherine. Although we never saw him drink, it now makes sense why he had Catherine's martini in his hand when he believed the plane was about to crash. In his final moments, that's all he wanted. Murdoch's only goal is to tell Mick why she withheld her declaration of love for him. She decided it would be better to concentrate on the kids because she was terrified, exhausted, and overburdened. She's still terrified, exhausted, and overwhelmed, it turns out. She does, however, miss Nick. Nick informs her informally that he met Michael. Meredith is ecstatic. Michael is the best, isn't he? Meredith purchases a piece of information and reveals that Michael, Lola's tutor, only dates men. Nick informs Meredith that he should have never allowed her to leave with a sly smile spreading across his handsome face. She agrees as they make out in a hotel corridor as he asks to share his life, love, and pain with her. Fourth, love connection. Speaking of romantic relationships, poor Sam, the squirrel laver, has tried his hardest to impress Joe. And let me tell you, for only having his words and beautiful looks at his disposal, he accomplished quite a bit. Unfortunately, Link's jealousy was the only emotion this flirtatious celebration stirred up. Finally, in the pouring rain, he admits to Joe that he has loved her since they were young. What's this? Joe also adores him. And if I hadn't been obsessively rooting for Jink all these episodes, I may have been a little myth that Sam, who I firmly believe is already dead on an operating table, was the victim of their confession. There is simply too much blood on the ground for Sam to survive this. If Owen Schmidt, Kwan, and Jink were in the OR, you think someone other than the inexperienced interns would have been there to assist with Sam and Teddy, who is presently not breathing. However, as I already stated, unless there is some information indicating that Ken Raver is no longer a part of the show, I will concentrate on all the love pheromones present in this season finale and believe Teddy will be okay in season 20.